Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. Thank you all for joining. What a day. And what a day on the markets. And what a year it has been. It's been quite remarkable. But thank you all for being here. And thank you for the early likes, everybody. Much appreciated. Things are really coming back today. It'll be a short story. Well, no, it's never a short story. I always try and say, oh, I just want to do a 10 minute video. It never happens. But I'll make sure this is fast and it's going to be packed with knowledge. We're going to talk about Bitcoin. Look at a ton of very impressive on chain charts. Crazy adoption like I haven't seen in a very long time. Go Metcalf's Law. If that works, we will look at AI stocks, AI tokens, celebrate a birthday. Uh, we'll look at some rates, what's happening in Europe versus the USA and also potential Forex trade for the Forex traders out there. We will also look at debt. We'll look at quantitative easing and we'll look at all the stuff that the market is already kind of sensing, you know, the so-called pivot, the so-called money printer. It's all happening, which, <laughs> which is why the market's going bonkers today. Uh, it's full on risk mode. And it was funny watching the market close today, the last half hour, you could tell all the capital allocators were getting nervous, like, oh, God, God, better get some, better get some. So a ton of money flowing in. Anyway, let's just jump in. This is about Bitcoin adoption and how it's booming and a whole lot more. So first of all, none of this is ever financial advice. It's just edutainment. And I mentioned the story. Uh, yeah, so we'll skip. But let's just talk about the news. Everywhere you look right now, any rag, even those rags that hate Bitcoin, they're all publishing stuff like this. I just grabbed a couple of random headlines real quick. Uh, bank sector stress may provide a bullish case for cryptocurrencies. Here's how. Barons. Crypto will survive banking woes. Here's how. And barons are normally quite negative against Bitcoin and crypto. Forbes also. Amid crypto bank crisis, Fidelity expands Bitcoin Ether trading to most retail accounts. Yes, that did happen. Uh, then other stuff. Bank sector stress may provide a bullish case for cryptocurrencies. Uh, that sounds very similar to the other one, I guess. It's printed in two different places at the same time. And of course, the street SVB collapse. Bitcoin emerges as the big winner. So what's going on? Well, first, let's look at this. Bitcoin holders are burgeoning briskly. As you know, I like my alliteration. That sounds a little bit like old English. But the number of addresses holding greater than 0 0.01 Bitcoins just hit a new all-time high of 11 million 663,315. Had that written down, I wouldn't remember that exact number. And that is a new all-time high, ladies and gentlemen. This stuff is being adopted. And no matter where you are in the world, you're looking at your bank and saying, hmm, that no longer seems like the safety place to park money. You look at your treasuries. Hmm, <laughs> that doesn't look safe either. So it's like literally the life raft is becoming the life raft. I've been talking about it for two years. It's actually happening now. We see it. In addition, let's look at this rapid adoption. Another view of this from Santiment. I think the previous one was Glassnode. Um, Bitcoin's rate of network adoption growth is prospering. Even with the volatility and unpredictability of so-called crypto right now, the past two months, total amount of Bitcoin addresses has grown by nearly 2 million. And that's a 4% increase in a very, very short window of time. You know, people were saying back in January, well, I was saying that Bitcoin had a flat line. There wasn't a lot of activity on chain. But boy, has that all changed. Thank you, banks. You've made this happen. Uh, let's look at some exchange flows between Bitcoin and ETH. Uh, I don't want this to be a full kind of on-chain thing, but there's some interesting things happen. You can see here Bitcoin and ETH flows to and out of exchanges. Uh, has diverged a little bit, except for over the last week, Bitcoin and ETH net flows tanked. Everybody's pulling from exchanges. And yesterday, I think I shared, we had one of the biggest withdrawals from exchanges ever since FTX debacle happened. In addition, 67.7% of Bitcoin has not moved in over one year. The trend is kind of a little bumpy, but it's up and to the right. And this goes all the way back to 2010. Obviously, that's when it all began. And it's hard to believe we're 13 years, nearly 14 years in. And that's stunning. But that just gives uh, people pause. Now, if you go to the six months plus, that percentage is 77%. So it's like 23% of Bitcoin are technically available 
or at least exchangeable, tradable out there, which is also a bullish sign. More news as well regarding Bitcoin. Uh, it's like every, like, like the most important thing is when you see the term Bitcoin smattered in every single rag, news release all over Twitter, etc., it gets people's attention. And that's why all this adoption is having, happening. Now, this one for people that allocate capital, Bitcoin is up 50%. You know, when we started on January 1st, uh, Bitcoin is trading about 16,500 because people are waiting for that magical 12,000 or 9,000 or 10,000 or whatever. And uh, here we are, 25,000 again. Well, just under that right now, it's 24,9. So give or take 100 bucks. And um, thanks to a rally that began, technically, <laughs> when the bike banking crisis began, uh, it was uh, somewhat of a surprise given the closure of Silvergate Capital and Signature Bank, the two of the biggest lenders and on-ramps for the crypto industry, them being shuttered, I was nervous for a while, but boy, it has not stopped the adoption. People thought, oh, on-ramp shut, oh, this thing's going to shrivel up and die. Mm -mm, has not. In fact, because all this happened in the US, US represents 4% of the world population and probably 10, 12% of the spending in this space. But remember, the other 90% of the world and the other 96% of the population can still have at it. And when you try and ban something, you make it more popular. Uh, let's talk about another 50%er, not the 50% gain for the year, but Bitcoin dominance nears 50% as research hails bullish narrative flip. Yes, Bitcoin that was not quite at 50%. This is the last time I checked, 46%. But still, that's up there. And that's pretty good so far. But again, everything has changed and it's just... The speed of risk, I would say risk happens fast, but how the narrative for Bitcoin turned around since Sunday is stunning. It's only Thursday, it's five days later. Let's talk about some chain activity back as well, because I did notice over the past two weeks, old coins and chain activity, daily active users were down across the board, but they have bounced back too. So here are some of the big chains. You can see some big action jumping up, Arbitrum popping up to 113,000 daily active users. Solana back up to 333. After the big green blip you can see there, uh, people kind of were not that active for a while, but they're coming back too. Um, the Polygon 342.9, 343K, 10,000 higher than Solana. And Ethereum, 450K. Um, and we have some other names there as well. Cardano's down uh, quite a bit, actually, 47,000. They're normally running around 55, 56,000. Near, near is always near, very flat. And Avalanche also kind of flat. But uh, it was good to see some people coming back online and doing activities. In addition, somebody is three years old today. And again, three years is a very, very short window of time in the development of something like a layer one. But guess who is three years old today? Yes, Solana. Happy birthday, Solana. And again, when I started looking at Solana, when I first said, this is, looks really, really interesting from a technology perspective, there were no users, there were no DAOs, there were no nothing, it was pure technology. And here we are, two years after that, the adoption has been quite dramatic. And remember, we've got Helium going live, I think in March 27, 11 days. That's going to be very, very interesting to watch. Let's talk about AI tokens for a second here. Uh, Open AI, the company behind ChatGBT, unveiled their big version 4, and the world is on fire. And so are AI tokens. You can see here, this is the change over the last seven days. You've got Injective up 50%, Singularity 42%, the Graph 29.83%. That is the one that we've been talking about since November. Nice to see it come back. Render also. Uh, Dr. Imran is a big fan of Render, 26%. And uh, Fetch and others. So it's been pretty good. Uh, this recent surge has been very, very impressive. Again, running on the coattails of all things AI, which is a hot topic. Let's look at AI stocks because they've been bonkers since the beginning of the year too. And it's interesting how you have this complete correlation between crypto assets in a certain space that's red hot and equities too. So these are all kind of jumping on the whole chat GBT now version 4 revolution. And the difference between version 4 and version 3.5 is quite stunning. But uh, I just put some of the favorite ones that I like and I included Microsoft, which I don't like. 
but uh, it's nice to see Google returning up 13% year to date, Microsoft 15%. Look at the correlation between those two lines at the bottom, the purple and the pink. They are real, real close together. Then you have Meta, which I know it's a social network, but it's also a huge AI play. Up a whopping, let me try to read that number, make sure I get it right. It's 64, yes, 64%. Remember, Meta was trading at $90 <laughs> back in November. Stunning, stunning. And it shot to 205 today. Uh, Tesla up 70%. Again, that was also in the toilet at the beginning of the year. And NVIDIA, the winner of them all, 78% having a huge day breaking out. So this is just uh, a space to watch. This is where I am focused from my equity holdings. All AI plays and people say, Oh, hang on. Tesla is a car company. It's like, no, no, it's not. It's not. And <laughs> NVIDIA is a semiconductor. No, no, no. They make uh, all, all, well, the reason they're doing so well right now is because they're selling so many chips because ChatGBT runs off NVIDIA chips. So anyway, you get the idea of how these things are really, really, really developing fast. And this is a narrative to watch. And this is where you want to be for the next couple of years. Um, let's talk about switch gears for a second, try to figure out exactly why things like Bitcoin are so popular and why people like Warren Buffett's buying oil companies and try to wrap our heads around exactly what's going on. There have been some changes. And you know, the old, well, the four most dangerous words in investing is this time is different. But there's a lot of stuff that is definitely topsy-turvy and different. So tech stocks are up like we avoided a recession. Oil prices are down like we are in a recession. Regional banks are down like the banking system has collapsed. Big banks are up like the big banking system is fine. Bonds are up like the system is collapsing. And GDP is growing despite recession expectations. It's like, what's going on here? It's like so, so, so confusing. So let's look at the IA macro model is something we built during the bear. And this kind of is kind of the first thing that sniffs out a change in the macroeconomic, not sentiment, but actual activity based on over 20 different data sources to determine exactly what's going on in the world. Are people making stuff? Is stuff being shipped, etc.? Well, that just turned positive for the first time since May 2022. It's very hard to see the tiny little blue peak coming up there, but I put a green arrow on it. You can see it on the trading view chart. And that is interesting because, you know, we turned negative badly negative only a couple of weeks ago. Just eat positive. So what's going on? We're not sure, but we'll monitor very carefully, but that's a good sign. In addition, this is a huge deal that just happened today. Warren Buffett came out and he decided to buy more Oxy. And this is also the macro model, but it's, it uses our denominator and it looks at when you have the macro situation. So for example, as I mentioned, Oil is down, which means we're probably in a recession, but no, we're not. Things are different. That's why you need something to kind of keep you honest. So the macro is just inched up, and we have a thing called the macro benchmark model, which compares the actual underlying asset, for example, oil, to an equity like an oil stock. So you can see exactly when you should be holding it and when you shouldn't. So the bottom part is actually, well, the top is the chart of Occidental Petroleum, bottom part is when the stock oxy outperforms the price of oil and that is when it's green when it's red it means oil outperforms the actual stock so you know which one to pair trade as you go forward and again a big part of this channel is all about swapping everything as a pair swapping in between different assets so you can maximize your alpha and that tells you how to do that so i am wondering why considering everything that's happening and how oil is going to be depleted over time and not be as popular as we electrify the world. Why is Warren buying oil stocks, especially at this level? The time to buy would have been lower like a few months ago or a couple of years ago. Anyway, we'll see. Back to GDP. This is interesting. Big thank you to Sanjay for sharing. The last estimate uh, for GDP was down, but it has recently exploded. The March 15, 2023 GDP Now model estimate for real GDP growth in the United States, seasonally adjusted, of course, in the first quarter, 2023 is 3.2%. And that's up from 2.6% a week ago. 
what is going on? Now, remember, uh, I always mention this. People think, oh, inflation kills everything. No, it doesn't, actually. Inflation can actually have a very positive effect on GDP because it increases the nominal value of output produced in an economy. And nominal GDP is calculated by multiplying the quantity of goods and services produced by their market prices. Obviously, as the prices go up, the GDP goes up. So inflation is good. Inflation is also the only way for a country to escape debt. That's why they always have, you know, they pretend it's 2%, but really it's 5, 8, 10% all the time. So that's the good GDP news. Maybe, maybe there will be no recession. And part of it is because of this. Obviously, the more money you pump into the system, the more everything inflates. And the world hates inflation, of course. They've just been trying to fight it for the last year, but they just stealthily sticking another you know, two trillion into the market. Let me explain how. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, the new Fed bank backstop has the scope to inject as much as two trillion dollars. And the usage of this, the uh, try me, I always get this acronym mixed up. FBTFP, BTFP, bank term funding program, I think, will be big. The largest banks will probably not tap the program because this is the big five bailing out all the other banks. But up to two trillion, JP Morgan believe could be tapped by the regional banks or all US banks outside the big five. And Fed officials have reportedly said that the BTFP is big enough to cover all insurer deposits in the US. But remember, there's 18 trillion. 18 or 19 trillion of deposits, only seven are actually insured. So this backstop is to cover all the rest, just to keep a lid on everything else. Can you hear that? Hear that money printer? Yeah, it's happening. Now, this guy, Mr. Gundlach, Jeffrey Gundlach came out and uh, he was on TV and he said something really cool. Uh, he talked about a number of different things in this interview, but he said, shutter the Fed and just use the two year. The U.S. does not actually need the Federal Reserve. The bond market balances everything out automatically. And that's why I always talk about the two-year. And you always need to look at the two-year because that's going to tell you where the rates are going to go. Not the Fed, which is, which is bizarre. The bond market tells the truth. He also spoke about the fact that unfunded liabilities were nearly 800% of GDP. And Social Security will run out in eight years or less, which... Whenever you say that, you frighten a lot of people that depend on it, and they should be correctly frightened. But when you look at the U.S. government just pumping another two trillion into the system, yeah, they're going to bail that out. Let's look at the two-year first, and uh, I hope I, yes, I do have my debt slide coming. I thought I forgot to put it in. This is the two-year, and you can see how it's moved from 5.05% to about 3.93% over the last five trading days. The largest five-day decline, <laughs> 112 basis points for a very long time. I think Black Monday back in 87. Now, while the two-year has collapsed, the combination of extreme flight to safety, and this is part of the whole Bitcoin narrative as well, the flight to safety, bank failures, the Fed, etc., they're going to be forced to do something. What they do will be very interesting over the coming weeks. Now, let's talk about the European Central Bank. For all the Europeans out there, how are you guys? Versus the Fed and what's going on? Because Christine Lagarde did raise by 50 base points today, which is kind of interesting. And the Forex traders out there, uh, this could be interesting for you guys. Uh, the markets have cut their pricing for September federal funds rate by 125 basis points. So the market is telling us there'll be a lot of cuts. If they do 25 basis points in each cut, you can all do the math. That is five cuts by September, which is huge. But while they've cut the same thing for the ECB by only 80 basis points, and the markets are saying the shock is taking the US uh, much closer to recession than the Eurozone. Interesting. And I just showed you some GDP data that says things may not be that bad. But Forex is pricing this also. And basically, that means the, the British pound and the euro should be stronger against the dollar over the next six months. Let's watch the space and see how it turns out. Uh, let's talk about US reserves. They're declining. While there's still a three trillion uh, of reserves in the US banking system, a significant portion that is held by the largest banks like the big five, like JP Morgan, etc., Tidal liquidity has been caused by the Fed's QT, the quantitative tightening, and also the rate hikes. 
and that has induced a shift to money market funds from bank deposits. That's also part of the problem with the regional banking system. And the Fed is also losing money, and the Fed net worth is now negative. So the only way to backstop this whole long-term holder type debt and everything else is money printing. This means they can no longer do QT, or they'll do a stealthy QE. Either way, Bitcoin sniffing it out. And that flight to safety is happening as you've illustrated as well. Again, you see how everything is integrated together. But let's talk about the big, big, big elephant in the room. And this is a monster. Everybody, this is from Brad Mills. It shows you the Fed debt maturity pyramid. And the most important thing is just the bottom half of that period pyramid, uh, six and a half trillion is maturing in 2023. And another 2.7 trillion is maturing in 2024. All of this stuff will roll into a much higher rate than what it's currently at. A lot of this stuff is financed at 0.5% or 1% or 1.2%. This is going to roll into a much higher interest rate. But there's a bigger problem. Not only is it going to roll into a higher rate, which is going to cause huge deficits, but who is going to buy $9 trillion worth of US treasuries. Hands up, anybody? Chinese? No. Europeans? No. Russians? No. People in South America? BRICS economies? No. Uh, Saudi Arabia? No. So <laughs> they're going to probably have to buy this $9.2 trillion of debt from themselves, which also means money printer drop and blow. Let's look at the debt, debt, big picture. Quick reminder, last time I showed this was a month ago, and it, you've got to add up the stuff in the black. So top left corner is U.S. national debt, 31.619. It's above the 31.5 debt ceiling, ladies and gentlemen, by the way. So they pretend there's a debt ceiling, but really there's not. It's just BS. And the bottom right-hand corner is U.S. unfunded liabilities. Last time I added those two together four weeks ago, the total was $212 trillion exactly on the nose. Today... It's 213.87. We've added nearly $2 trillion in debt in just 30 days. The thing's exploding quicker than you can ever imagine. And when you look at the tax receipts versus the GDP, I added some ratios here. The U.S. GDP is $26 trillion. U.S. taxes, $6.8. Uh, so basically, taxes only cover 25% of GDP. And the debt, okay, the total debt is 814% or over eight times the total US GDP. So there's no way this stuff can ever be repaid. And that's the big message here. And this debt is exploding and it's going to explode even faster because the deficit's going to be bigger and the interest services and costs are going to be a lot higher. So sorry to hammer that home, but just the two trillion in 30 days and extra debt is stunning, stunningly big. Now let's talk about CBDC light. This is the Fed now timing. And this is from Dennis Porter, and he had a very interesting observation a few, few minutes ago. The Fed moving closer to central bank digital currencies. At the same time, the digital asset space is being unbanked, or they're shutting down all the banks. Coincidence? No, we covered this last week. There's no such thing as coincidences. Let's talk about the Fed now thing. This is the so-called system where instant payments can be made. And the Fed now is going to launch in July 2023. And many people call it central bank digital currency light. They're putting their kind of toe in the water. But imagine, imagine you have this Fed now thing. I don't know exactly how it's going to be wired up or where you're going to be able to pull your money from your bank. But if you can do it rapidly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, instead of how the system works today, that could only accelerate bank runs out there today, which is interesting. In addition... I wonder, are you going to be able to wire this up, your Fed now, to be able to buy crypto? That'd be hilarious. Maybe they're going to be the new signature bank. Maybe they just want to track who's buying crypto. Who knows? We'll see. Fun times. And in addition, this was an article as well that the Fed now may draw in low-income users because maybe nobody else will trust it. Um, and that could be bad. But again, they're going after any type of market. So... It'll be very interesting to see how this thing flies again. Look at that as a central bank digital currency light version. The next step will be Big Bang. And finally, somebody is having a good time looking at the Western banking crisis. 
And this is Mr. Putin from Zero Hedge, Russia mocks Western banking crisis. And he says, aggressive sanctions have provided insulation from the Russian economy. And the Kremlin is looking very, very smug right now. And they are proud of their system. They're proud of their commerce. They're able to export a lot of gas and oil despite the sanctions and to be able to get the currency they want for it too as well. So again, everything is breaking. Everything is upside down. And Bitcoin is winning. And I think that's all that matters. So everybody who is here is happy, I think. So big thank you, every and everybody in the chat. Quick one today, only 26 minutes. And uh, thank you all for being here. Hit the like on the way out. Let's try to get to a thousand. I appreciate you all. Make sure we get the good news out there to everybody. Thank you. See you all tomorrow.